again, going back to foster care, like you have these kids who have trauma, who have pain. And I think once you feel like, okay, this is my calling, this is what I'm supposed to do, you still can't control the choices that they make afterwards. And it's freeing. I feel like a better parent because I've recognized I can't control my foster kids. I can't control my adopted kids. I can't uh, control my bio children. Mm -hmm. Man, this is all in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's a freedom there. Yep. Welcome to the Loving God, Loving People podcast, where we talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus in our everyday lives and how, in the end, all that matters is God and people. Here's today's episode. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the podcast today. We have another guest with us. This is Jihei Watson, who shares a last name with me, happens to be my next door neighbor and is married to my brother. Mm -hmm. Jihei, welcome to the Loving God, Loving People podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So tell us, so give us a little bit of background, kind of your story and like the quick elevator, like how, how'd you get to where you are following Jesus, all of that. Give us kind of your, your faith background. Let's start oh, there. Man. Okay. So I grew up in Toronto. I was born in South Korea and I came to know the Lord at my Presbyterian church growing up in Toronto. And then I you know, graduated university and moved to Korea. And I think that was a really interesting time for me because I don't know, my faith was kind of my own. And I was around a lot of new Christians, or I was around a lot of Christians from all over the world, from uh -huh. like Australia, even from here, the US and, uh, and in Korea as well. And so it was just interesting to kind of see like what I believed in and walking my faith out. And then I actually met your brother in Korea. He so was you met this, this Marine yeah. in Korea. This really good looking <laughs> blonde, blue eyed boy in Korea, which I know my parents sent me to Korea to get, find a husband. That's probably not what they had pictured, but <laughs> that's fine. Uh, he is everything in his heart of what my parents wanted for me. So that's perfect. Um, so, you know, Chris moved back to Arizona. And so I followed him and we got married and then we had all these kids. Um, and at some point, we also decided to become foster parents. We thought we wanted to have a fourth child. We have our okay, three so bio. Okay, so pause there. So okay. you guys, you had three kids, and you had kids, like, right away. Right away. We got married, got pregnant in our first year on purpose. My parents are a little bit older, and your parents, uh, I mean, you have grandparents who are yeah. still alive. Like, yep. Grandma and Grandpa Watson are in their 90s, or early 90s, and they are like a big part of your life and a part of Chris's and a part of our grandkids or their grandkids. And I love that. And so for my parents, I just thought um, they were 60 when I got married, basically. And so I was like, man, they are, we're lucky if they make it to like high school graduation for some of my kids. And so we decided to have kids right away. And then we had three. Now, I'm going to pause you for a second. Go. Here's the real story. Okay. My brother and I are very competitive. Oh, you guys are ridiculous. And we got engaged. Lindsay and I got engaged. Uh, in May. Yep. Oh, no, in, you got In December. Married. Yes. Yes. And then you guys got engaged, and then we got married, and then you got married the same year. So we were ahead on yeah. engagement and marriage, and I think Chris just really wanted to to win the whole, like, who's going to have a kid first thing. So that was that was very noble, mm, the whole, like, oh, grandparents, and it's beautiful. Okay. Uh, let me tell you Chris's motivation. So it was all competition. We're also old. We're <laughs> older than you guys are, and so we just had to, like, get the get the ship sailing. Here. Okay. So so you had three kids, and yeah. at, at what point, and what was the, the turning point when you said, hey, what if we pursued foster care? Kind of walk walk us through that moment. So we decided we wanted to have another sibling for our children. And you guys grew up in a family of four. You're very close to your brother, obviously, proximity wise and all that and being next door neighbors. I'm very close to my sister. I have three brothers as well. I love them dearly, but I'm not nearly as close to them. Uh, and so we had Lily and Mia and we had Topher. And I was like, man, it would be so great if we had a brother for Topher. I mean, there's no control over that. So we're like, another sibling would be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time that we thought that there was a foster care crisis in Arizona. So in 2010, maybe mm -hmm. 2011, there were like 30,000 kids in Arizona alone. In the in foster, foster system. system. Yeah. Which. That's a lot. That's a ton of kids. Like, like when just I say 30,000, people are like, oh, is that nationwide? I'm like, no, that's in our tiny state. Yeah. You know, and there are different things that happen in foster care. But at the time, the pendulum had swung where basically kids were taken if any call came out. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like 
we actually from Sun Valley watched all these terrible videos where they're like, hey, you could be a foster parent. I was like, no. Because um, at that time, I, I do remember um, the governor came to churches and said, mm-hmm. hey, government is a terrible parent. Yeah. Uh, we, we cannot meet the need of this crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but churches and, and people in the church, which yeah. is really where even the concept for foster care came from, totally. was, was followers of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so the government came to churches and said, Hey, can you guys help? Can you guys do something? And so there was a network of churches that that we're a part of. And we said, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it Mm -hmm. in church and and all of that. And so, um, so you guys got suckered in, (laughs) suckered into it. Um, and and you guys heard the need and and Mm -hmm. said, Hey, we can do something about this. Yeah. And it is also one of those funny things where earlier in the year I had been praying like, God, give us a a mission for our family. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be a missionary in Africa. Bless those people who do that. God has called all of us to something. Mm -hmm. And it's not always this glamorous, beautiful, crazy thing. That's like, I'm doing this huge thing. And I kind of wanted it to be a soup kitchen on Thanksgiving for our family to be like, oh, we can't join you on that turkey trot because we have to serve. This is our calling, Mm -hmm. you know? But as we prayed about it and this came up, I'm like, really, God, like a day to day thing? Ugh. Okay, fine. So we went ahead and, you know, got licensed and became foster parents. And the first year of being a foster parent was the absolute most humbling thing Mm -hmm. and definitely something that helped me draw closer to the Lord in my walk because I realized how prideful and stupid I was, you know? What, what, so, cause you went through training yeah. and, and preparation for mm-hmm. it. What were the surprises once you guys actually started uh, having kids brought to your home and, and started fostering? I think in, in life, we just always have these expectations, right? Mm-hmm. Like we have an expectation of what we think marriage is gonna be like. We have an expectation mm-hmm. for what we think we're gonna be like as parents. And so foster parenting is an extra layer of, man, I think I'm gonna be this way. I expect the children who are coming into my home to be this way and that's fine. I'm ready for it. I'm gonna attack this. I'm gonna be incredible. And you have no control. Yeah. And something that God has constantly reminded me of, especially being married to your crazy brother, is that I'm in control of nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, when he and I met, he was a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. So I guess he's still a Marine, but- Good job. Hey, good recovery there. (laughs) But then after that, I mean, he broke up with me. I was not in control of that. And then he decided, oh, I'm going to go work in Iraq in 2004. Yeah. So he he volunteers to go back- into military life in, into, into the war, war zone. in Iraq yeah. as a contracted security guard. Totally. I'm like that's Which, how an cool interesting is that? choice. All the all the guys listening. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Anyhow. <laughs> your brother is cool. I am a it, fan. But if you're sure. if you're a woman and you're you're dating that guy, that's not cool at all. It's not cool. I was like, okay, <laughs> the Lord's going to take his yeah. life. That's I mean, good for him. He walks with the Lord, so he'll go home to Jesus. That's fine. Um, we decided to get back together while he was in Iraq and then we got engaged. And then he became a police officer. I'm like, so many great choices, Chris. And so I'm not in control of anything he does. He's not in control of anything he technically does either. Like the Lord can take him. I know people who have died in car accidents Mm -hmm. and have left their children. You know, like his life is at risk. So is mine. Mm -hmm. Our kids go to school. Bad things happen at schools. Mm -hmm. I think we're all aware. Like we're in control of absolutely nothing. Yeah, life is fragile. Yeah, life is very fragile. And I feel like... God is constantly reminding me of that. And so saying yes to foster care was like, here's something that you have no control over, but I want you to do this crazy thing. And I'm like, ugh, fine, I'll do it. But it's funny because I did still have that expectation of like, I know you said I'm not in control, but maybe I can be in control of this. Mm -hmm. And my expectation for myself was very high. I'm like, I'm a stay at home mom. I have these three phenomenal kids already. I'm gonna be a great mom to whoever God brings into our home. And the sweet girl came into my house and she was a toddler. And I don't, I didn't even really like the toddlers that came out of my body. So it's like really hard to connect (laughs) with this toddler that was essentially a stranger to me, but now living in my home. So the first six months that we had her was actually really great. She was fantastic. She was very easy and complacent and all those great things that I love in children. But (laughs) then she turned two Mm -hmm. and I'm not kidding it. Like it changed. Everything changed. She decided she didn't want to sleep anymore. She wanted to cry all the time. She didn't want to eat the food I was giving her. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I truly have no control again. And so it was humbling. And that last six months, I kind of struggled with some like health issues and just Chris got a schedule change as a police officer. And just everything felt completely out of my control and it was miserable. And I was probably very depressed in that, those six months, those last six, seven months that we had her. 
And I was like, man, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted to say, I checked that box. Lord, like, remember you asked me to do this thing? I did it. I failed. I'm sorry. Like, can we move on to soup kitchens? Can we revisit the once a year mission, right? But it's one of those things where I was like, okay, we're going to do this one more time. God, like, give me an easy one or give me a really hard one. And then I'll know Mm -hmm. that I can be done, you know? And our next placement was 36 hours. And I was the best foster mom in that 36 hours. I crushed it. And so I was like, dang it. I think he wants us to keep going. And the next day. Wait, so so you went how long with the first place? 13 months. 13 months. With and the then, first one. And then the next one, it was a hours. day and a half. Yeah. So one night. On the ball. Just yep, crushed it. Guys, I was like, you are getting all of my love, yep, little baby. And, and the goal of foster care it's is reunification. Mm-hmm. You nailed it. That's what I'm saying. I got 100% yes. on that. It was incredible. And so then the next baby came and we also said, okay, we don't thrive with toddlers. Like, yep. let's not just say yes. And that's the thing. Like, you don't have to say yes to everything that comes your way. Like you can have parameters, you can have boundaries over what you think you can do. Hang on. What you just said is really important. Cause I think some people, they let, they let guilt drive them mm-hmm. Absolutely. where they go, well, there's a need. Therefore I must meet exactly this need. Yeah. Like God's also given you wisdom mm-hmm. and insight and totally. wise counsel and other people that can help speak wisdom into your life mm-hmm. and all that. It's okay okay to say no to certain things. Absolutely. Even good things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, even my trainer, our foster care trainer was like, the need is great. Mm -hmm. You can't, you're not going to answer the need, Yeah. but can you answer this calling, this little corner of the need that God wants you to take care of? And so then our next placement was a sweet little baby boy, three days old. He was so beautiful and so precious. And he's never left our house, you know? Yeah. So we adopted Wes. We love him so much. And Wes is how old now? He's five now. Five. He's okay. At summer Jam. It's the best. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. He's going into kindergarten. So I finally have, I'm launching all into elementary school. Yep. Which is crazy. Now, now I'm going to back up again, because what you said, I think is, is massive. And even when Jesus is talking, um, there, there's this one statement that he makes one time. He's like, hey, the poor you're always going to have mm, with you. Yes. He, he makes a statement of there's always going to be need. Mm-hmm. That's never going to change yep. until Jesus comes back and, and makes all things right for all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not a, so don't meet any needs. Yes, totally. It's, there's always going to be need. Mm-hmm. So pick something. Yes. And so I think for people who are listening, it, it could be that it's foster care. It could be that it's, it's something else. There's needs all around yes. us all the time. And if you're listening and you're a follower of Jesus, part of what we do mm-hmm. So we go, okay, what can I do to help meet needs mm-hmm. in, in the community, in, in yeah. this world? How do I leave this world a better place than I found it and mm-hmm. follow Jesus in, in that regard? Um, so that was really good. So I, I wanted think... to, you're saying a lot of great stuff. So I'm just pausing and, and I love it. repeating what you just said. So yeah. Keep going. And I think even with the picking and choosing of like, what can I say yes to? I mean, we got calls for like twins. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> That's, one million percent. Yeah. I just, I know that doesn't fit yep. in the box. I know we're supposed to like let God challenge us and stuff. But I was like, no, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe out in the world, we all need relationship and we all need families, but I also know not every family is the right family for each child. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to have a foster child or a a person come to your home, come to your family and say, Hey, this isn't actually the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. That's okay Mm -hmm. to say, man, I did the right thing in this season and we're moving on Mm -hmm. and we're hopefully still doing other things where we feel like I, it's not I one and done, right? Like I did this thing, check, let's try something completely different. If our thing is always helping people to meet, know, and follow Jesus, like that's not ever going to be finished, mm-hmm. you know? And so whether it's foster care, whether it's supporting other foster parents, whether it's walking with birth moms, which is a huge need as well, walking with what, kids. So explain that, walking with birth moms. Like, like actually people just... possibly at risk of losing their kids to foster the foster care system or people who have already lost their kids to the foster care system. So somebody who's lost a kid, but now is pregnant and is running the risk of, Hey, you might repeat the same behaviors and now you're going to lose. But there are also the moms who have their children in foster care and they are getting services from the state. And Mm -hmm. there are different uh, organizations out there that walk with these birth moms that say, Hey, you have a birth, you have a plan, a parenting plan. I want to help you walk it so that you can get your kids back. Okay. So those that have lost their kids yeah. in, in, into the system. It's not a one and yeah. done, you know, but even, I mean, I just spoke with someone from foster care initiatives and like, that's what they do. They just walk with these birth moms. Um, the organization is the called foster care initiatives. initiatives. Yeah. And a friend of mine who works there, her job is to walk with these birth moms and say, okay, you have a parenting plan. 
What can we do? How can I help you Mentoring, walk through that? Mentoring, coaching, All networking. But hey, also I... sometimes making that hard call. Man, I can't do this. I can't parent my child. Mm -hmm. But I see that they're with this foster family that wants to adopt them. I'm just, I have to let my rights be severed. And maybe we can still have an open adoption. Maybe like we mm -hmm. can have different avenues. But man, the day that the judge says your rights are severed, that's a hard day for that mom. Yeah. My friend is walking with that mom on that day, crying with her, but saying, man, you did a brave thing. Mm -hmm. So again, like the umbrella is massive. And there's a, a pastor out in Texas, I want to say, or California, uh, Jason Johnson. And he talked about, we're not in control of outcomes. So again, this, this goes with the need, right? Like mm -hmm. needs are great. We can't control what our kids are going to do. Like I said, I can't control Chris. Mm -hmm. I also can't control other drivers out on the road yep. from hitting me or hitting anybody. I can't control what my kids are going to do in life. Mm -hmm. Sure, it'd be nice if they went to Ivy League College and got scholarships for that. I am not in control of any of those things, <laughs> yeah. right? But I think even more... Which is, it's a major frustration. Yeah. I would love to be in control of my kids. I would be, love It'd to be, be in control so of convenient. everything. Yes. Absolutely. I would love to be in control of Chris. I would still probably mess them up somehow if I was in control, but right. less than maybe they might do themselves. So I'm... Exactly. Yeah. Right? I, and I think, too, just I'm going to speak to our generation for a second. I, I think very much we don't want our kids to fail mm -hmm. and we don't want them to ever experience hurt yep. or pain or bad choices. Mm -hmm. We want to just protect them from it. And yeah. it's actually damaging mm -hmm. to them when they never experience any of that growing yep. up. Um, and, and so, yeah, it is a major frustration to not be in control. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a huge relief to realize I'm not in control Absolutely. at the same time. Absolutely. And so, again, going back to foster care, like you have these kids who have trauma, who have pain. And I think once you feel like, okay, this is my calling, this is what I'm supposed to do, you still can't control the choices that they make afterwards. And it's freeing. I feel like a better parent because I've recognized I can't control my foster kids. I can't control my adopted kids. I can't uh, control my bio children. Mm -hmm. Man, this is all in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And it's there's a freedom there. Yep. You know? And so uh, we can't control outcomes, but we can still make be brave enough to like get in the water you can, you and can, do something. You can influence outcomes. So right. that's that's not a, hey, your parenting doesn't matter. Yes, for it sure. It 100% matters mm -hmm. how, how you, you raise your kids. Um, getting like, we, we were just having a conversation about this because you saw your daughter mm -hmm. volunteering with yes. kids ministry and, and leading and um, using gifts that you didn't even know she had, right, you know, sure. and, and she's starting to, to figure that out. Um, statistics show that one of the number one ways our, our kids follow Jesus in their adult years is by, as a student, when they serve younger kids mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and getting into that, that habit. That's a way we can influence kids to yeah. a, a good outcome, getting them in church, getting them serving, getting mm -hmm. them around other adults who love Jesus and are going to be a positive influence. Friends, mm -hmm. who they hang yes, out with, totally. helping them find great friends. Mm -hmm. um, that, it's amazing how much influence, but at the end of the day, the number one influence in the life of your kids, mm -hmm. your foster kids, your biological kids, your adopted kids, yep. all your kids, um, is you. Right. It, it's the parent. And so there is still that, that responsibility, mm -hmm. but we trust God with the outcomes because we right. can't control them. Yeah. And, you know, we were just talking about like fine lines. And I think there are a lot of fine lines in life like you want to feel confident in who God created you to be, but you can't be prideful and mm -hmm. say, oh, I've, I've got this. And then you don't leave room for God and the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, like that's something I learned in foster care, especially in that first year, I was like, I'm going to be the best foster mom ever. And then I was humbled when I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. This kid is driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I love when people are like, oh, I could never foster because I'd get too attached. Like, imagine your least favorite coworker coming to live with you <laughs> all the time. They're just there every day. Mm -hmm. You know, that like water cooler talk that you can't stand. It's there Yeah. in your house yeah. all the time. And so it's funny because, yeah, kids are great, but some of them are really hard. <laughs> And, and sometimes you're really glad, like, okay, I did like, it for a season. You're like, reunification happened. Yes. Okay, <laughs> we did you got to go. Yes. Um, that's a great illustration of the coworker, by the way. Yeah. Like you don't, let's not be fools. Like we don't mm -hmm. love everybody. 
Like, don't pretend you love everybody. I, we should try to love everyone. And I think we're seeing that in society. Like, oh, well, I don't love you. So actually you just stay over there. Like, and that's would, not what I'm talking about. And I would say with like that, that kid in particular, you love them because mm-hmm. love is action oriented. You're demonstrating totally, love. Totally. You just can't stand them. Right. And sometimes that happens. Mm-hmm. And God still calls you to care for them. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I just, I've learned too much in foster care. There's a lot out there, but all I want to get across is that, man, there are just so many things we can do. Mm-hmm. And my purpose isn't just in foster care because I'm actually not a foster mom anymore. So for me to be like, oh, that was my purpose in life, as if that was a one and done thing. Mm-hmm. Like God is still calling me to love and serve mm-hmm. others. And I think that for people out there who feel like, oh, I don't have a purpose or I don't have a thing that I'm supposed to do, you're supposed to serve and love people. Mm-hmm. So love and serve your children well. And I think, again, it's that fine line, like, man, I want to care for my kids, but we can't shelter them and protect them from everything. So what does that look like? What different choices do you maybe have to make? And I love the series that we've been in where, you know, we're talking about margin, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can we be interruptible like Jesus was? Like, he walked along the road and he cared for people. He touched them. He spent time with them. Like, can we do that? But when we're like our PR people are moving us from one thing to the next Mm -hmm. and we are our own PR people. Like we're not allowing God to say, Hey, do you think because you are at home and you already have these kids, do you think you could add another one that didn't come from your body, but you can still care for even if you don't like them all the time. Right. And so there's so many things that we think, and then there are things that we overthink and there are things that we underthink. And at the heart of it, man, if God is calling us to love and serve, like, how do we do that? Yeah. And how can I do that? How can I do that for someone who is going to give me absolutely nothing in return? Mm-hmm. And so fostering is a great option. Yep. Supporting foster parents who are already fostering is a great option. Yep. We still, so now we're a family of nine. We've adopted four kids, uh, three out of foster care. And we have friends of ours who have also adopted. And they send us pizza probably once a quarter, once every other month. Just for the sheer fact that we're a huge family and they know it's a blessing (laughs) to me to not have to cook one night and to use paper plates and throw them out. Yep. We can afford pizza, but that's not what it's about. It's about them showing us, man, we support you. We Mm -hmm. love you. We love what you guys have done. And we just want to walk alongside you. That's a beautiful thing, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think people are like, okay, fine. You're guilting me into fostering. One million percent not. If there's something in your heart that thinks maybe I could do this, then yes. Talk to me. I have a podcast. You can listen to it. I'll encourage you in that journey. But if it's not fostering, I think we, I think we're able to put links and stuff on there. So I think we'll stick a link in there. I don't actually know how this works. Our, our crew is like, they're super smart. They got it. They 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 figured it out. They know what they're doing. So yeah, we're the fostering voices podcast. You can listen to that. But I use the example of like, or I was asking if you had already talked about our bus driver, because I feel like you Mm -hmm. had. And he's a great example of, man, you have this job that other people be like, oh, man, you're a bus driver? Like, where's the notoriety in that? You know who he's famous to? The 30 kids on his bus. Our entire neighborhood he's famous to because he is the best bus driver in the history of bus drivers. If you're a bus driver listening to this, I'm sorry. It's just because maybe I don't know you. Um, But of all the bus drivers I do know. He's the best. Ross is the best. But he knows the kids. He loves the kids. He treats the kids. I There's no way he has a budget, but he like, or a, <laughs> like a bus budget where yeah. they're like, oh, we'll definitely spend this much money on your kids. On every prizes year. Yeah. each Friday. But for- <laughs> every Friday, the kids come home with candy and they yep. come home with candy for Wes because he's not on the bus yet, but he knows Wes exists. So he yep. brings candy for him too. I'm like, man, how important is it for these kids to get on the bus every morning before school and be greeted by this man who knows their names, who knows their dog's names, who knows their brother's yeah. names, and who says, man, how are you doing? Put your mask up a little bit, whatever. <laughs> but he, do- he does his job, but he goes above and beyond, which is what Jesus did. He did his job and he went above and beyond and he had time for other people. Mm-hmm. And so in our lives of like walking these fine lines, I want to care for my kids. I don't want to prote- I want to protect them. I don't want to hurt them. But man, sometimes our protection is hurting them. They're not experiencing life. They're not able to make mistakes or feel pain or sadness. That's not real, people. Mm -hmm. And so just taking a moment and saying, man, is there margin in my life? What is God asking me to do to serve his people and to love him and to love his people well? And just, just sit with that for a second. Maybe it is a soup kitchen. 
I'm not taking away from soup kitchens. That just wasn't my calling for that season, yeah. right? But man, God is calling us all to something. Mm-hmm. And when we do the thing that God is asking us to do, it works. The clocks, the cogs are all turning. We're all doing this thing together. I'm thankful for you and Lindsay living next door and helping us out with the revolving door that we had, you Mm -hmm. know, and saying, hey, you guys can go out for dinner and we'll watch all of these children. Kate is one of our adopted kids. She's 28. She needed a family and we're happy to be it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think she was meant to be in every family out there. But I feel super blessed that God, you know, brought her into our lives. And we said, oh, you want to, you need a place to live? Okay, we need an extra hand. And she was like, okay, you said free room? Yes, I will, I'll come, <laughs> right? But like, that's how it started. But where we're at now is never anything that I could have possibly imagined. But she is like a huge blessing to me, to our family. Um, but it's it's obedience, like... What is God calling you to do? Can you not be afraid? Can you just take a moment and say, man, I'm, that sounds a little crazy. That mm-hmm. may not be what I had pictured, but I believe there is reward on the other side of obedience. So I'm going to say yes. I'm going to take mm-hmm. these little steps and, and just and follow where you're leading me. And, and here's, what I, here's what I believe 100%. There, there is always reward mm-hmm. on the other side of obedience. Yeah. It may not be immediate. Yep. It may not even be in this lifetime. Absolutely. <laughs> it might be on the other side of eternity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do believe there, there is reward that follows obedience. You see that through scripture. You see that principally. Mm-hmm. Um, good things in life happen when we follow the one who authored life and created Absolutely. it and knows and wants to give good gifts to his kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the way we, we experience that is by trusting and, and following him. So I think everything you're saying, I agree a hundred percent. And, um, a, as we conclude any, any last thoughts you have for people or anything you're like dying to, Oh, I gotta, I gotta share this. And if not, uh, I'm going to have you pray okay. and, and pray for us, mm-hmm. all, all of us who are listening, um, to be willing to take that step, even mm-hmm. if it's scary, mm-hmm. even if we're not in control of the outcome, yep. uh, to, to have the courage to go, I, I could take one step. What's yep. one thing I can do? Mm-hmm. I think, again, we just sometimes overthink things and we underthink things. And we just, we have to live in that middle ground of, I see these people doing this thing. They must be sp- specifically outfitted to do this really crazy thing. Uh, I think sometimes foster care looks like this thing where you're like, oh my goodness, these kids have trauma. They have this pain that I don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Chris and I share our stories, we're like, we are the most basic, average, ridiculous people. I mean, Chris loves mowing his grass, you know. I Who doesn't? You guys are very (laughs) special. You guys are meant to be neighbors. Um, But we're not doctors. We're not anything. I have baggage. I have my own, you know, trash that I carry around with me. That doesn't mean that, like, I can't walk with these kids. I can't walk with people who are hurting. And so if you have any inclination to walk with people, there are people for you to walk with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people are like, I want to be an influencer. I want to I want to do these things. Maybe my reward will be fame. I'm like, you don't need to be famous to these people. Again, Mr. Ross, you don't know who he is, but he's famous to us and to our neighborhood. I think that is way more valuable than any number of Instagram followers or, you know, Mm -hmm. brand deals that you're going to get. Make an impact on the lives of those who are around you. But if that's all you have, if your influence is here and all of your energy is going into that, I want to encourage you and challenge you to just take that tiny step to grow it a little bit more. Add one or two people who don't know the Lord or who you know are hurting. Maybe they do know the Lord and are still hurting. Can you walk with those people? Mm -hmm. So let's just serve those in need. That's great. Good word. I love it. Okay. Why don't you pray for us? I will. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity to just talk about serving and loving. And God, you are the perfect example of that. And we all fall short but we're thankful that you still use us. And so, God, I pray that with humility uh, and confidence, God, that we can still walk in the way that you are calling us to walk and that we would follow you uh, obediently, even when we feel scared, even when we feel unsure of what the outcomes may be. Uh, God, that we can know that you uh, have your spirit in us and that you are able 
and you have only imperfect people to work with, and so we are qualified to do the thing that you're calling us to do. And so I just pray for um, peace and confidence for those who are listening who feel like you might be calling them to take another step in their faith journey, uh, in serving others, in loving others, and in loving you. And God, I just pray that we would all make an impact uh, on our communities and that we would be able to serve with joy. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jihei. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Loving God, Loving People podcast. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and click the bell so that you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this conversation, we'd love it if you would like this video, leave us a comment, and even share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people meet, know, and follow Jesus. And lastly, you are always welcome to join us each week for one of our services right here live on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.